Good afternoon, everyone. We're flying at 26,000 feet, moving up to 30,000 feet, and we've got clear skies all the way to Las Vegas. And right now, we're bringing you some in-flight entertainment. One of our first-class passengers would like to sing you a song inspired by one of our coach passengers. And since we let our first-class passengers do pretty much whatever they want, here he is. Everybody, welcome. My name is Matt. I'm here with Andrew. Today, we're going to be talking about The Wedding Singer, the beginning of Drew Barrymore's cinematic love story with Adam Sandler and their promise to grow all together on screen and off. So grab your popcorn and Reese's Pieces and let's break it down on the Post Credit Podcast. probably made that series continue on is really kind of they tried it but mold the, his predecessor or not his predecessor his uh his protege it, protege yeah there we go it, it's like you know they they tried to do it like with amanda and stuff like that you know and they could have really taken the series Hello, further amanda. with that yeah but but i want to play a game <laughs> but you know they, they could have really tried to mold the the you know his the following characters you know yeah. and then the cop and then you know but they kind of just kind of were like you know let's just try to get some crazy kills and kind of just kind of yeah yeah so hey i was gonna ask you this uh well i want you to st- tell your story on the mic about your stop at the gas station on the way over well here. i stopped and and i'm wearing uh one of our podcast uh the podcast our post credit podcast yeah the shirts which if anybody listening would like a post credit podcast teacher uh a teacher, teacher sure. yeah i get a teacher problem socking today uh, uh, the post credit podcast shirt uh let us know you know we we haven't really got into merch stuff uh i don't know if people just do that on their own or they only start making them and you know when people want them yeah but it you know we made them for ourselves and family and everything but um anybody would like that but yes you were wearing your shirt uh to the gas station yeah and- somebody recognized it and saw it and uh was talking to me about it and i'm like yeah i know that's my podcast actually. it's always good to have one of those real life experiences with somebody who actually listens because i mean we we know we have a good amount of listeners yeah um but you know it, it's hard for somebody you know people that listen to podcasts they don't typically like sit there to, and will email back and forth or, yeah. or associate or comment or, or even rate and review you know, people want to get on podcasts, listen to the podcast, and then move on, yeah. which is understandable. And we never really ask people for ratings and reviews for that reason, because yeah. it's like, well, you know, it's 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 not likely. I don't want to hound people. Uh, we we don't do op- the show for the ratings, and right? Reviews. Right. I will take this opportunity though to yeah. say, if you if you have time and you're listening to our show, um, please give us a, 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 a five star rating and a review. That way, we can. Uh, that, that that's how this show gets out to more people is through our, our ratings and reviews. You know, besides us uh, doing any kind of uh, marketing, which we really haven't gotten into yet or anything. Um, that's how people find us is through ratings and reviews. So if you could. Uh, go go to Apple Podcast uh, and uh, give us a good rating and review. Yeah. But it's cool. It's cool to see people out on the street that have seen it and, and know what it is and and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, I got to um, get on the Groundless show yesterday. Yeah. Um, talked with the dudes there um, about uh, season two, episode twelve. It's uh, a episode called Reckoning on uh, the show Justify. It was an FX show back in uh, the early. Uh, 2010s that aired um, has Timothy Timothy Oliphant as a U.S. Marshal and there's a bunch of really good actors and actresses in it. Obviously, if you guys have been listening, we have a uh, complete series review on that in episode one. Go check that out, please. Um, but we talk about the whole. I talk about the whole show with with the guys there. Now, one question that they did ask is why weren't you there? I, and I explained it, but I, I can go ahead and let yeah, you explain. The, it. No, the main thing the main thing is is uh, f- the most important thing. It was my son's birth, the first birthday. I explained that. So that that was the most important reason why not. You know, and and the thing is is I like Justified. Don't get me wrong. That's the most I, I important like thing. The but they did know that before that. You know, I talked to him, uh, you know, and told him that you like the show, but you just don't get into it like no. you do everything else. Now, that don't allows get, you to get on the mic and talk about it. Right. Don't get it twisted. The se- season two is the one season that I'll rewatch a few times. Right. I mean, just because of who plays... Uh, Margot Martindale and Jeremy Davies. Yes. I mean, it, phenomenal, phenomenal. Both it's are some, the only ones that... Drew Oscar or Oscars uh, Emmys, Emmys for that yeah. show. 
But I mean, th- those two characters, I mean, the whole family, that whole family is just phenomenal actors all, all the way up from the dumb brother or the from the dumb bro- brother to the other bro- crowders. The yeah. Bennetts. Yeah. The Bennett's it, that it's just the whole thing was, was, uh, that season was phenomenal. And the dumb and, big brother, uh, or dumb, you know, little big yeah, brother, yeah. Coover. Coover. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, actually plays, um, Tom Collins, uh, the moon, Tom the Collins. moon guy in the new stand, uh, adaptation. That's right. You were telling me about that. Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody's keeping up with the new stand that, uh, stars Alexander Scott, and James was good. Marston and stuff, I did watch the first episode. It was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that guy, uh, plays Coover on that. He's, he plays Tom Collins, which is one of my favorite characters from the, the stand story. Yeah. Uh, Tom Collins and, um, Nick. <laughs> And that's right. It's time for our, um, with apologies to Alice and Janie. Okay. Um, okay. So last week we talked about, what did we talk about? Happy Gilmore. Yeah. Right. We also talked about Jane Curtin. Okay. But we didn't talk about Jane Curtin. <laughs> we talked about Jane Levy, oh. who is an actress. So remember, we made the mistake of, we were, t- we were talking about the, the prime players for, for um, Saturday Night Live, right? Yeah. And uh, we were trying to think of uh, Jane Curtin's name, but we... I thought we said Jane Lynch. No, we said Jane Levy because that was the one that was an evil dead ah. and everything. But um, but yeah, so, you know, we, we had talked about uh, 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 um, Jane uh, Levy instead of Jane Curtin, uh, who was uh, an original cast member with Chevy Chase, Gilda Radner, all those people. Coneheads, all that fun stuff. And she was in Coneheads, Third Rock from the Sun, all that kind of stuff. Um, we'd accidentally called her uh, Jane Levy. Um, you know, this this is somebody who who won you know back to back Emmy awards for uh, best lead actress um, in the comedy series for uh, for Kate and Allie, uh, which she played Allie, and and then uh, you know she's she's gone on to done do uh, many things, and she was actually included on a 1986 list of the top primetime actors and actresses of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, being part of that original, yeah. so I mean, she's very iconic. Yeah. So we just wanted to take this time to um, to to get those apologies out of the way and uh, and to uh, suggest you go watch, you know, the first couple seasons of Saturday Night Live because we've talked about that in the last couple episodes and how you know Saturday Night Live yeah. is definitely not what it used to be. No, I uh, you know, and everybody makes mistakes. You know what I mean? I mean, we we do a lot of this and. And I, I don't really know anything until Matt Matt uh, gets into this certain uh, specter of our uh, show. But uh, he, you know, I, I don't really know what he's going to come up with next or at least let me know. So I, I do apologize. As far as you apologies know. to Alice yes, and Janie segment? Yes, yes, Well, yeah, it's just one of those things that, you know, I'll get in there and just mention. We don't have to have a big conversation about it and all that kind of yeah. stuff. But just wanted to mention. You know, she was, uh, you know, the first cast of Siren Ally. They were called the Not Ready for Primetime Players. Yeah. That's what they were nicknamed and everything. So, okay, before we start, what's your top three Sandler movies? Top three Adam Sandler movies. I don't think we've gotten into this yet. Happy Gilmore's first, right. obviously. Um, I probably like, I'm going to have to say 50 First day, Dates a second. And probably Wedding Singer third, to be honest with you. Okay. I, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, like like, I think Little Nicky comes in close because I love Little Nicky. It's it's very it's not the best show movie oh, in the this world. This is Ladies Night. <laughs> John Lovitz. I had to tell I had to tell my wife who that was because she had was no peeping clue. through the window. Yeah, I, I told her who it was, but it didn't really explain it to her so much because you can't really say, "Oh, John Lovitz was you know the and main actor in this in this nowadays. yeah he in hasn't this done Emmy winning for years." And so yeah. it's weird to live in a world where like you say John Lovitz and you would probably have half the room go, "Who?" Well, wasn't he on Saturday Night Live too? Uh, yeah, yeah, oh, he was. He 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 did some things, even if it was just guesting or whatever. But you know, he just I, I think he had a certain type of humor. Yeah. Which is good in the nineties. Yeah. It just it's it's not one of these things where like Adam Sandler where you can kinda adapt with the times or whatever. Yeah. And if you need if you see the re- re- reoccurring th- thing here with the wedding singer, John Levis plays basically the same character in Little Nicky. Because he's singing the, the, yeah, the same song. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so but, he sings that same song and then and, and little Nicky is just before he falls out of tree yeah. and goes to hell. <laughs> but 
you know, so your top three are uh, Happy Gilmore, Fifty uh, First Dates, Fifty First Dates, and The Wedding Singer. Yeah. Okay, so mine is pretty close, but it's Fifty First Dates is number one, then The Wedding Singer number yeah. two, and then Big Daddy is number three. I've always loved Big Daddy. That's the, a good one. The him going back and forth with Leslie Mann, you know, Judd Apatow's yeah. wife. But the uh, thing with that, that is, is that was a different, that was a more cynical Adam Sandler, I felt like. It was, but that, that's a point that I was going to make is that, you know, we've had Happy Gilmore. We've had Billy Madison. We had the Big Daddy and stuff. You, you got all these characters with him being a certain type of person. He becomes yeah. a good person. Yeah. This is the, uh, the sweetest it's, it's isn't it? It's the, the sweetest or most kind Adam Sandler we've ever gotten, it, you know, up until then and until now. Because funny he, people, he was kind of like yeah, that. but he was he was kind of a curmudgeon guy, and you know, he was of course depressed about not being with his ex, yeah. and now he thinks he's sick and all this kind of stuff. But the wedding singer, he's just a happy guy. Yeah. Right, the anger's underneath, and we talked about last episode about how after the reviews of Cisco and Ebert. You know, he changed his whole thing from being angry all the time and relied more on his sweet guy charm with the anger lying underneath, yeah. you know, just underneath the surface. So I feel like this is the first time that we've gotten the real sweet guy and everything <laughs> until he slowly breaks, breaks down at his own funeral or funeral, his own wedding. wedding. Do you remember when he was going to get married to Linda at the beginning of this movie and his sister runs out and was like, yeah, there was a notes and she's not going to come to the wedding. And his face is kind of like, Oh, did it say anything else? Like, well, like that's classic he's, Adam he's Sandler. He's speaking soft, but like his face is contorting into yeah. this. I'm about to flip out. Yeah, type that's of thing. the that's the classic Adam Sandler. We see that. That's the first when real, he goes to real, the tent and smashes the yeah because you don't really see the very smooth operator like he is at the beginning of the movie, where he's very kind of smooth and he's giving these speeches and things like that. And you don't, you don't smooth, like you said, smoothing over yeah. Steve Buscemi's horrible best man. Speech yes. And, and that, and that's the Adam Sandler that we're not used to. Yeah. Now where right, right. That's when it starts off. When we really see the real Adam Sandler that we're used to seeing is, you know, right when he is left at the altar, you know, and, and one thing I liked, I, I thought was great with this movie on talking about this mm -hmm. is that, they didn't make it so that he did like three or four weddings where he was depressed and just sad and, you know, just down on marriage and things like that. They did one, one wedding reception where he was depressed and down and stuff like that. And then, you know, Drew Barrymore and her character came in and really kind of calmed him down at that point and kind of give him, gave, gave him more focus and gave him more, uh, a mission, you know, you know, to, to basically tell him his worth, you know what I mean? And, and yeah. she realizes that he's, he's worth more as a wedding planner than he is even as a wedding singer. Well, not you only know? that, but he stopped doing weddings after yeah. that. He was doing bar mitzvahs and right. uh, other things that, because he's like, I can't do weddings anymore. Right. It's and and the reason that she, you know, she did that is because he had that conversation, you know, almost kind of the same conversation with her beforehand because you know she you could tell she was not necessarily getting cold feet but she was you cold know feet. not getting yeah she she wasn't getting uh technically a date set for the for their wedding you know and stuff like that you know and and so she was kind of feeling down on herself so he talks to her you know at his good point and then after afterwards you know they they didn't carry it on they didn't do multiple receptions where he was just like ugh because you know I think that would have been too much yeah you know? it was a well written tight movie yes, it, yes. it didn't have a much Absolutely. To be, they could have probably maybe filmed scenes like that but then just cut them out just because it made it tighter you, like you know this. what I mean though when I'm saying that right it's just it really instead of dragging it out they just you know made it one time and then he, and then he changed course yeah you because know? it's like you know if somebody's per portraying misery well yeah like adam sandler does he, he does very well then you don't necessarily have to harp on it too much yeah. because it's like okay if you're harping on it maybe it's it's something you need to you need to show a different aspect of it yeah. or if it's just a movie about mental health or whatever yeah. then that's okay but you know if somebody just is in like a comedy movie they portray the agony well. Okay, they portrayed it. Let's move on. You know, if you harp on it, then that's when people get to say, "Okay, this is a comedy movie. I don't want to sit there and and listen to this." Well, and, the, and, it, and it shows to the genius of Adam Sandler too. You know, really his his acting chops. You know what I mean? The guy. The, and yes, I did say he's he's a genius when it comes to acting because if you don't think he's a genius, look how much he's worth. You know what I mean? People pay 
you know, he's he gets paid so much money to do films. You know what I mean? He, as far as financially successful, nobody's more financially successful than Adam Sandler from Saturday Night Live. Well, and I've talked about this before. It's the, it's the Nickelback thing, yep. right? Yep. You know, uh, Chad Kroger, the, the, the front man for Nickelback, you know, before they got big, yeah. he studied what made pop songs popular. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what made hit songs. Yeah. He studied that and wrote their songs their music you know from from the results of that study you know yeah. and <clears throat> so you know there's a reason why they 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 make hit after hit you know same thing with adam sandler you know he's not the best actor in the world or is you know i mean he yeah. just did on cat gems dude but i mean he's never you never saw that because you know he's said before he goes you know i can i could do their reviews talking yeah. about movie reviews he's like i could write them for them now yeah because they're all the same they all yeah. say the same thing and he goes but i didn't get into movies for reviewers he yeah. said i got into movies to one make people laugh yeah and two to have fun with my friends and he and, and he, he's the type of actor i mean i'm not saying I, I don't know him personally so i don't know how what he went through and things like that but he's the type of actor it doesn't seem like it bothers him i know him personally he didn't go through that okay much. no well no i mean you know <laughs> It doesn't seem like it bothers him, you know. He get he might get a Razzie or something like that, you know. But that might actually better his career. Just getting a Razzie for a comedic actor to get a Razzie, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, he got a Razzie for Pixels, but it's one of, Pixels is one of his highest grossing movies. Exactly. So you know, but, what do you but, want? To say but that shows that? to the genius of the man because you look, you watch a movie like Anger Management, right? Who it goes through pretty much Adam Sandler's psyche. You know, I mean, it kind of explains a lot of his psyche and the way he, I mean, he, that he's always angry. He's a comedy actor for the general crowd, yeah. the general audience. Yeah. You know, you have certain people like Seth Rogen or whatever, you know, that's, you know, a more adult. Yeah. Potty humor type Version of, of Adam Sandler whatever, in a right? way, yeah. yeah. Like you said, this is like the PG-13. So this but you is, know why that is, right? Because, and it's smart. I mean, yeah. it's like, yeah, he could go. I mean, and he has done, uh, you know, things that were a little bit over the top and yeah. everything. But like I mean. Jill, uh, Jill well, or yeah. whatever yeah, it is. Uh, 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 Jack and Jill. <laughs> okay, so that, that movie is one of those movies where I'll never watch it. I'll never watch it. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. For that reason, I, I felt like it was almost like a. It was like a joke should, on me. I should stick, if I watch that movie. I should stick a really annoying clip from Jack and Jill in right here. Just, <laughs> well, but but I mean, you know, with, with this movie, in your honest opinion, is there really a better comedic couple for our generation than Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore? No, and I do want to get into that. Um, let me intro this real quick. As, okay. uh, this the what we're talking about today is the Wedding Singer. It came out in 1998. It was directed by uh, F uh, Frank Caracci. Um, uh, and uh, the writer was Tim Hurley, who also wrote Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore with Adam Sandler. But, you know, this idea came around. Adam's like, I want to write, uh, I want to do a movie about a wedding singer, you know, who gets left at the altar. Yeah. So that was kind of where this came from. And then the writer was like, you know, I want to write a movie based in the 80s. So we're going to write a movie about the wedding singers based in the 80s and stuff. 85 to be exact. Yeah, 1985. And this director, uh, I, I believe I'm saying his, his name right. Um, it's Frank, and then his last name is uh, C-O-R-A-C-I. Uh, Karachi. Allison Janey episode next. Yeah, I know. So, uh, but he's actually been a director that's worked with uh, Adam Sandler um, more than once. Uh, he did The Wedding Singer. He did The Water Boy. He did Click. Uh, he did uh, Zookeeper and Here Comes the Boom, which are um, Kevin James movies. Yeah. But I believe they're Happy Madison Productions. Probably. I don't quote me on that, but Chris but Farley Part it's, Two Point it, Yeah, it's a, there's a good chance. And yeah, and like Adam Sandler, you know, Chris Farley were very very close really good friends he sings about him all the time yeah. has his own song about chris farley and everything so the fact that you have kevin james who in ways is like him just a toned down version yeah, or no, whatever not it's the a little weird chris farley had yeah but he also directed uh, blended um the ridiculous six <laughs> that was such a <laughs> stupid silly movie. and that's 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 the things that he's done with adam sandler and everything ridiculous six now blended this is another okay so there's been uh, you're talking about drew, drew barrymore, barrymore this yeah. couple all right, so this couple, um, they've been in three movies together. They've yeah. been in The Wedding Singer, Fifty First Dates, and Blended. Uh -huh. Now, Blended is also is, is obviously you know the worst of the bunch. Yeah, I still really, really, really enjoy it. Yeah, because <laughs> Adam Sandler is just as funny as he as he was in some of these movies. Um, uh, you know, there's not really a whole lot to the story. It's a very predictable story, different things like that. 
Uh, but it has Drew Barrymore and Adam Sandler together. It has everybody from every Adam Sandler yeah. movie you've ever seen is in this. Yeah. You know, it has Terry Crews in it, you yeah. know, singing a blended song, you know, about <laughs> being blended and everything. You have uh, uh, Joel McHale in it as the, uh, as, Joel as the father of awesome. Drew Barrymore's kids. And yeah. he's just like this slack, not slacker, but this jackass who, you know, yeah. he's just the typical, you know, hey, you know, Ex-husband. suave guy yeah. who thinks he's, you know, he's like the uh, Glenn in this movie yeah. if he was. Uh, if he was played, uh, you know, if it was in modern times, this is what he would look yeah, like, Glenn yeah, would, right? Yeah. You know, back then it was, you know, dressing like uh, Don Johnson yeah. in Miami Vice. And, and that's, that's here it'd be like Joel McKay. And, and it really does, again, <laughs> it goes back to talking about his genius, you know, and, and the fact that a lot of his characters in his movies are exactly the same people from other movies. Not not the actors, but, you know, the way that these people act, you know, you can actually go back and say, hey, that's this person grown up or whatever, you know? Like a lot of the Adam Sandler movies, a lot of it, even, especially in more of the later years or whatever, it's it's almost just about the experience of watching yeah. these actors have fun together yeah. again. And, yeah, know, it really and is. To, and to think of how much fun they're having behind the scenes. I mean, you know, regardless of the story that's yeah. going on. If you get into it, I think as much as you and I do, yeah. but it's fun to watch stuff like that. And for him to say, you know, I, I do this, you know, to make people laugh and to have fun with my friends. I mean, yeah. that's that's the goal of life. Oh, right? absolutely. And and that's the goal I mean, of everybody in life. Look, look at his first be. first big movie and his first movie, really, in my opinion, not overboard. But, um, you know, look at look at, you know, with Billy Madison. Right. Uh-huh. He brought on Chris Farley. His first the, uh, the, leading. Yeah. Movie, yeah. yeah that, Chris Farley with with, you know, being the bus driver and stuff was hilarious yeah. you know but again you could tell that you know Chris Farley probably had a blast playing that role you know I mean just it just seems like every actor in this film and it's probably why Drew Barrymore keeps coming back is because you know she's considered part of the Sandler universe now you know and all these actors seem like they have just a blast together you never hear scandals or anything coming from any of these movies you all all you hear sandler himself yeah exactly and and all you hear is everybody talking nothing but good things about adam sandler you know and how much they've helped he's helped them in their personal lives you know like terry cruz and things like that but you know for drew barrymore to keep coming back with adam sandler the reason i think they work so well together is because you know i think drew barrymore and Adam Sandler are almost probably like how they are in real life in these movies. I mean, she married Tom Green, you know, or whatever. But you know, Tom she had him on her new show. I don't oh, know really? Oh but man, he's he's just as weird as he's always been. I, I mean, mean, you know, that was our generation like he did yeah. back then. But I mean, he's just very weird by the. But by but the way they he talks they now. work so good together because I feel like they they almost play versions of themselves in a way. You know what I mean? Because like Drew Barrymore has always you know with 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 Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler is the the hothead. The goofball, the the person that doesn't, you know, all his characters I'm talking about, mind you. And Drew Barrymore is adorable. Yes, yes, and and and, and she she lets him be who he is. You know what I mean? It's it's like, you know, you could see these two people being together in real life because, you know, it's like she's like, oh, I know he's goofy, I know he's like this, I know he's like that, but you know what? It, he he's there when it counts. You yeah. know what I mean? He's he's. He's the person that she she needs and wants when it counts. Yeah. You know? I just wanted to say before Stranger Things, before Wonder Woman. Okay. Before the retro 80s revolution we are having right now. Yeah. The wedding singer back in 1998 reveled in the 80s first. Yeah. Um, they, they brought the, this was like the, you know, nowadays where everything's going back to the 80s, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, fashions and mm-hmm. music, you know, a lot of electronic music. Take me home tonight. And different things like that. I mean, everything's going back to the 80s. And now they're having TV shows that are being, and movies that are being based yeah. in the 80s because everybody loves the 80s. I feel like, you know, when we were younger, it was in the 90s and stuff, you know, we had the, uh, the our parents' generation or the yeah. older generation. Uh, maybe even the one just a step above our parents talking about the 60s and you know mm. the the uh just talking about how amazing the 60s were with music and you know of course you know with drugs across the country and you know people being free man and 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 revolutionary and you know all these you know the 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 reminiscing about the 60s or whatever and i think you know nowadays you have people like romanticizing the 80s yeah 
Um, which which is so funny for me because you know I was born in the eighties and and here's a bombshell for you you do realize we're millennials right like no I, I know I, I had well, to look it up here's the thing though and I don't know if you're the same way but with me and I'm not gonna say it but the year I was born in yeah it is actually covered within two different like so you can kind of pick your own like the there's two different generations that overlap yeah and I'm within that overlap yeah so I could claim either one. Yeah, but so, I, I kind of fall in millennial apparently from what I'm finding out. I think out, both you of know? us can, it, can claim either one, so but dumb. we're closer to millennials. But anyways, whoever reordered those things <laughs> is the same one who added a new Zodiac sign and kicked Pluto out of uh, uh, the, the planet. So, um, the, 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 Damn the, you, Nick Saban. I know. <laughs> uh, so I have one issue with this movie. And it's it's uh, the it suffers from 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 certain situations at other movies where you have situations that are contrived, and I don't like when movies or especially TV shows uh, cause drama or conflict just because the characters aren't communicating, like in like they would in real life. Yeah. You know, in real life, you would utter the you know you would shout out these things if you had to. You know, in movies or something like they're about to say an important piece of information that would calm everybody yeah. down and reduce conflict, but then something interrupts them. And where Drew Barrymore runs into Linda or some yeah, but that I mean, situation. yeah, just different things like that. Where like you know, okay, they're going back and forth, and then they love each other. Everybody knows it except for these two, right? Or they may know it, but they're denying it, or they don't know how the other feels. Because well, the stupid sister, to it took other. her a while to figure it out. If you notice, it, it, even even his friend. You know, pretty much figured it out right. pretty they much both from the get go. Oh my gosh, you're in love with him. Oh my gosh, you're in love with this girl. You know, they yeah. had, they had that same type of scene. Um, but you know, it's like it's like in Cobra Kai. The only problem I have with Cobra Kai is that fifty percent of the conflicts in that, or maybe even more, what are because mean? just people don't talk. Yeah, like like Johnny and Daniel will not get out what they want to say yeah. if they just got out what they want to say it would reduce so much and their conflict. respective girlfriends and wives are it's telling so them stupid. literally to just say it you yeah know? and, and I, I think that's lazy yeah I, I think i think if you if you if you're concentrating on a certain aspect about like you know miscommunication if your movie's about miscommunication or if your movie's about lying to people yeah. or keeping lies or whatever okay then that's part of it but if you're doing like just a regular comedy movie or whatever and you need conflict I just think it's lazy to just have it be like, oh, oh, they were almost no, but yeah. we gotta we, we gotta stop them from finding out the truth as far as this this and this goes. When in real life, you know, most of the time you just be like, and you don't think you can chalk some of that up to just you know progression, you know, making the movie progress a certain way. I mean, you don't you don't want to chalk you, any of that I up to that. No, I think there's smarter ways to do it. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, because my my issue with it, this movie really. The only issue I felt like, I felt like they, they were trying to push the whole 80s theme a little much. I mean, Julia even had uh, Jane Jetson hair. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. me, George Jetson, yeah, yeah, Jane, yeah. his wife. And yeah. she had that exact type of yeah. haircut, hairstyle that, uh, and you know, that was yeah. a cartoon in the 80s. I, I, I kind of felt like they, I mean, we, we understood it was in the 80s and we get that. But it just almost fe felt like they were just overfeeding us. I think it was probably just like a love letter to the 80s. Like like, okay. like the director said, you know, I want to do the movie in these 80s. So they just threw as much 80s crap in there as they could, including soundtrack, which is amazing, of course, because it's 80s music. You know, a lot of the 80s music, if you closed your eyes or you didn't watch a music video or if you'd never heard the song before and you heard it now, you would think it came out now. Right, because there's yeah. so many electronic influences, which is what we have nowadays. A lot of real instruments are going out the window, and it's all being done in a studio and, and on a computer or whatever. Yeah. But there was actually two soundtracks released for this movie, because there were so many hit songs from the '80s uh, that they wanted to use for this movie that they had to release two soundtracks for it. Yeah. And uh, I just thought that was a pretty, that's awesome. Actually. I thought that was a pretty interesting thing now, to have to release two now, different do, albums. Do you recognize Christine Taylor? I do. She played uh, the uh, Marsha remake and the Brady Bunch movies right. in the 90s, and she's also married to Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller. That, I was trying to explain to my wife. She's like, who's Ben Stiller? I'm like, are you serious? Yeah, but, yeah, I, I always just remember her as as Marsha and the new Brady and the Brady Bunch and a very Brady sequel. Do you remember her in a 90s TV show? Okay. Tell and me what it was, it was about. A, it's a saying, and it's a cowboy's. 
Cowboys Ranch. Oh, yeah. Hey, dude. Hey, That's dude. That's right. Yeah, she wasn't hey, dude. Remember? But she was really, really, like, yeah. she was super young in that in that, in that TV show. But yeah, I, I, I remember watching like Hey, Dude. Yeah, like whatever. But, yeah, I, I, I do remember, like, when you're watching her as an, as an adult in these movies, even being younger, I was like, that's a girl from Hey Dude. Yeah. But now, now let I me let me ask you this: in, in in this movie, what they were wearing in this movie, who's probably the one character that probably could not get away with wearing the exact same thing he was wearing in the movie nowadays? In my opinion, I was looking at this. Well, one of them obviously is is Glenn. He he's dressed. Alec Colbert. He no 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 Glenn. He's dressed as. Uh, oh yeah yeah Miami, Miami Vice. Vice. So but, you can't but, get it, but yeah, Alan Colbert. But that that could be something that could you could actually see on the street somebody wearing the white with the. Maybe I the, just think it's so, well. That being said, yeah, like I was telling you, everything's coming back from the. Go 80s down to Miami. Yeah, they have there. There is that style from the '80s where you just have like the bright colors. Yeah. Where, uh, but maybe instead of like baggy pants or like parachute pants. Yeah. It's more like skinny jeans paired yeah. with that or something. But, but or with or Alan Culvert's character, his went style. For corduroy to come back. Yeah. <laughs> I think it did. Come, it came back in the. Uh, in late '90s, early 2000s. Well, no, that's yeah, they, you know, yeah. chords for slang. But but those stonewashed sure. jeans he was wearing with the tucked in shirt and the the belt that the 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 part of the belt that hung down, and I think he was wearing cowboy boots. Well, how about the beat it uh, uh, yes. jacket? The, the things Jackson he jacket. wore in this the movie. Glove. He's yes. like, I lose the glove. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing, the thing in the, the all the characters. Say hi to your brother Tito. <laughs> But literally, like, I mean, you know, because Adam Sandler wears pretty much the same style clothing in every one of his movies. It's it's basically how, and you see him in real life, you know, he's wearing the basketball shorts and the, the regular t-shirts that usually don't match. And this is what he's wearing to take the kids out to town. You yeah, know? he's actually the least dressed like himself in this movie than in the other. Right, movie. right. But again, you got that 80s Except feel to it. Cut gems, but yeah. But I mean, he's wearing, you know, he's wearing the, the, the band shirts and stuff like that. But with Alan Culver, you know, the, the guy that, his character's, clothing choices in this movie were phenomenal. I thought it was just awesome. He was always trying to be that guy that's yeah. taking every new trend <laughs> and wearing it like that. Now that you met... Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say, and you look at him in the last movie we, we reviewed... We reviewed. I said review. My bad. We talked about. That we talked about was, uh, you know, he was a bum. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? Just a homeless dude. Yeah. And, and, and man, and, you could barely even tell it was him. Yeah, that, that dude has a thick beard. He's, he's one of those characters that... Or one of those actors that cannot play a main character. I'm not saying that he couldn't. I'm just saying that he just doesn't I mean, have that the main only, character The only quality. movie he did play main character, it was a very popular movie. Oh, Grandma's Boy, right? Yeah, but I mean, it wasn't like a box office thing. It I was, love that it, movie, I think he though. got more popular when it came out on DVD. But, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, again, I'm pretty sure that's a Billy Madison film, too. Grandma's Boy. Getting into that real quick, since you mentioned it, uh, this movie stars Adam Sandler as Robbie Hart. Drew Barrymore is uh, Julia Gulia Sullivan. Now, Julia Sullivan, uh, Christine Taylor is Holly Sullivan, also has uh, Alan Covert, Matthew Glaive, um, Ellen Dow, uh, Angela Featherstone, Alexis Arquette, Christina Pickles. You know, Alexis Arquette, this is the second movie we've talked yep. about, um, was also in uh, She's All That. Um, Ellen Dow, she played Rosie. Um, when they first brought her this role and everything, um, she didn't understand what rap was. Yeah. And so when they talked to her about doing the Sugar uh-huh. Hill, the Sugar Hill Gang rap, she uh, she's she's like, well, what's that? What's rap? And so they kind of explain gr- it to her. Yeah. And she goes, well, can I can I move with it? You know, because she was a dancer. Yeah. And she she played piano and she's very good into music. So she she got into the groove and she learned it apparently pretty quickly. Yeah. The 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 Sugar Hill Gang yeah. uh, uh, rap and everything and you know that's one of the most popular parts of this movie. It was in it the is. trailer. It I is. remember. It's it's such that. it's an iconic scene. I'm gonna say it, but that that is an iconic scene. I said hip hop. I hip it to the hip to the hip hip hop. You don't stop the rock to the bang bang boogie. Say up jump the boogie to the rhythm of the boogie the beat. I like how she paid with played with uh, meatballs. Paid with meatballs too. <laughs> she just put them in his hand. And he's just like standing there, and then she grabs his hand with the meatballs and just squeezes stuff. And he's like, "Okay, <laughs> that's classic. <laughs> that's classic Adam Sandler, though. You know, because he's so. You know, if you notice, there's a lot of grandma themes in these movies that he does. Grandma or somebody that he's taking care of yeah. or whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But a lot, a lot of that in in his movies. You know, and. 
And then, you know, we come off from Billy, Billy, Ma- not Billy Madison, but Happy Gilmore and come to this one. And it's another grandma, you know, and, and, and it's the grandma on the this other scene. Grandma era. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, you look at watch Eight Crazy Nights, too, you know, and, and he's got the grandma, grandpa type feel, you know, with the, well, actually, their sister and brother. But Wait, what did you he know, say in this movie? He said, uh, yeah, my parents died when I was really young. You want to talk about that, too? Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember what came before that, but I, I gotta say, you know, Al Col- Culvert and Adam Sandler together with this, with especially the scene where where he's he's basically saying he's gonna give Drew he's gonna give it to Drew Barrymore, and, and the because fa- wait, you know, when this guy first met you, he said that you were in trouble. <laughs> you should make time to talk, don't you think? You know what? First time this guy saw you, he told me he was gonna hit on you. Really? That's not true. Yeah, it is. You told me she was in trouble. She was going to get it, and she didn't even know it. He's teasing. I would never say that. What? You said you were going to give it to her. Give me what exactly? Yeah. You're a jerk. What do you mean? You didn't know she was engaged. So now you're not going to give it to me? (laughs) (laughs) Very funny. Say hi to your brother Tito. <laughs> but I mean, can you not tell me how natural that scene was in this movie? I mean, that that was, I think, the most natural scene. It almost seemed like it wasn't planned out, or if it wasn't, it was just they were kind of given an idea of it, you know. But it's just like that's something that will would have happened in real life, you know what I mean? Like, like you know, you're with your boys somebody and just stuff, messing and with somebody, like yeah, that. And, and you're messing with your boy and 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 about this girl or whatever else like that but that's just so natural I mean the fact that I mean even Drew Barrymore it was almost kind of like she was surprised like truly surprised (laughs) at that yeah and and that she played along just so well with it and and, but that was definitely my favorite scene well my understanding is Peter Dante and Alan Covert were friends with Adam Sandler for a while yeah it was I'm assuming before Hollywood yeah so it wasn't like you know uh, Rob Schneider a um, Steve Buscemi yeah a you know a Chris Rock or yeah. you know any of these people that uh, Kevin James that he met when in Hollywood and then starts doing yeah. movies, Peter Dante and Alan Cover they were friends with him before that so you could tell that him and Peter uh, his, him and Alan Cover have a natural rhythm where you know he can give him crap and Alan Cover just smiles like no that's no <laughs> you're you're he's lying but you know I but mean the same thing with yeah the, and this was the first movie we got to see Peter Dante. And uh, he's at the table and he's like, ha. He plays the perfect stoner, I think, he in a way. He just laughs you know? at Steve Buscemi ruining the best man speech and everything. He's just like, ha. You know, and, and you got you to give credit to Adam Sandler. He's got a big back. You know, I mean, he carries these guys, you know, from film to film to film. I'm not saying he, he carries them because in, in their own right, they're phenomenal actors. And they've all you done know? their own things and everything. Yeah, but, but yeah, he it's just what goes to what he was talking about. Yeah. I want to I want to make people laugh and I want to have fun with my friends. Yeah. Which is exactly, I think, what I would do. Yeah. yeah. I You know, you get you probably get a bug every once in a while where you want to do something, which is what he does. You yeah. Know, he does. Uh, Punch Drunk Love, Funny People, yeah. Uncut Gems. You know these different movies where you know, okay, well, I want to try it, try it. But I mean, generally, this is this is what I, if I had the the acting, the the comedy chops, yeah. like he does, this is what I'd be doing. I'd be I wouldn't try to be doing. I wouldn't be trying to go vulgar with it or whatever. Be gross out humor, yeah. do this or that, or or trying to make a point or whatever. I just want to have fun. But you can't go as far as doing the MC Hammer thing. You know what I mean? Where you hire nothing but friends and, you know, thousands oh, of people. Dang, the dang cook thing. Yeah, right. and, and pay pay them so much money to the fact that you're broke, you know? It's just Adam Sandler is oh, a genius in it, you know? And, I and the fact about uh, Dan Cook's brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I'm saying with MC Hammer, he that's what he did. He ended up hiring everybody and just going bankrupt because he couldn't pay everybody, and he had so many people on his payroll, you know, where Adam Sandler is smart about it, where he, he brings his, his friends – and, you know, I'm sure how much they're in the movie, they get paid, you know, accordingly. But, you know, just the way he does it with it. And, you know, everybody looks forward to a movie with Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore because they are just, you know, the greatest comedic team since since Ben Stiller's dad and his mom. You I, know what I, mean? I don't even know if I'd say team. Well, yeah, I guess. But I, I just say it's one of my favorite couples, yeah. on-screen couples, because you have a few. What are some other ones where Jim you, and Pam? You know, but I mean, like they act in a couple different projects as different characters, but they end up being leads together a lot. 
There was another couple that that was like this. I just can't remember who it was, but um, well, Angelina Jolie and and Brad Pitt. You know, they they. I mean, they had that instant con- uh, chemistry. Yeah, I feel they like just did that one. I'm talking about. People that keep coming back and doing movies together because they have great chemistry. Oh, Keanu Reeves and, and Sandra Bullock. Yeah. They did Speed, and then they yeah. did The Lake House. I mean, say what you want about either of those movies. Those two have good chemistry together. Yeah. You know, it's these actors. Johnny that, Depp and uh, Winona, Winona Ryder. Ryder doing different projects yeah. or whatever. Wait, did they do anything else besides Scissor Hands? Uh, I, I f- no, Bonham Carter, though. Helena yeah. Bonham Carter and, yeah. and Johnny Depp have. Well, that's just because uh, her and, husband yeah. happens to be yeah. uh, somebody obsessed with Johnny Depp. Did you know this got made into a musical? Really? It did. It got made into a musical, and the same guy who wrote the movie, uh, Tim Herlihy, he helped write the musical. And, you know, they had to expand it, like, like not necessarily doing 80s songs, but, like, for instance, um, Julia's scene where she's putting, she's trying on the dress in front of the mirror, and she's trying out her name, Julia Gulia, versus uh, Julia Hart. Or Mrs. Robbie Hart or whatever, which, oh, that wouldn't go over well today. No. Um, but, you know, it's one of those scenes where in a musical, you can't see that reaction on yeah. that character's I face. I just didn't think like it would be Drew interesting. Barrymore. Yeah. You'd have to sing about it. They'd have to sing about it so mm. the audience knows. And like I said, I just wanted to mention it, but yeah. I don't like musicals. I'm not a huge fan of musicals, so we don't have to really talk about it. I, I And did you also know <laughs> that, uh, you know, Carrie Fisher was an uh, uncredited writer for yeah. this film. In fact, she put it into a place that people would enjoy the movie more than what Adam Sandler and um, uh, how so I think Judd Apatow was an uncredited writer too yeah I was about to say Judd Judd Apatow did it on it Carrie Fisher did a couple things she's done she worked on this script she worked on Last Action Hero and Sister Act yeah you know all 90s movies and stuff but I guess she was doing some writing because she had done an autobiographical uh, book Uh, what was it called I'll have to look it up, but uh, she did an autobi- uh, semi-autobiographical yeah. book on on herself, and so she started doing writing here. So you know, I suppose she's a writer, yeah, and she's very um, quick-witted. I, I, I'm sorry, but but Carrie Fisher in the gold bikini, it was just it was it was like uh, Bo Derek for for those people in the 70s, you know, Bo what I mean? Derek or uh, what's her name from American Pie, Shannon. Elizabeth oh yeah, Beth, well that was for more of the 90s, like yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. you have you have different icons, Phoebe Cates in the 80s, yeah, the yeah. Fast Times pool scene. Are you finished? Are you yeah, finished? Go ahead. Um, no, I just think you know the the. Who would have thought that you she... You know I've always wanted you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyways. Um, no, who, who, you know, who who would have thought Carrie Fisher would have, would have been a big part of uh, of this movie? You know, or just in, a, in a part sense. of it. Yeah, part of it at yeah, all. When you I was know? doing research, I was like, well, I, I never even knew that she did any kind of writing on scripts and everything. I yeah. know there's a lot of people like M. Night Shyamalan. He did a lot of writing on She's All That. Yeah. You know, and then you know, talk about this movie. It's, who would have thunked? You know, and, and yeah, and didn't didn't I think he probably did some? Did he do writing on like Angel or not Angel, uh, Dark Angel or something like that? I can't remember. Yeah, the, it. it I, I just think that you know the director wanted to go for the '80s feel. Yeah, he he did that right. He wanted to do the '80s music. Great soundtrack. You know, great great soundtrack. He wanted to put together, you know, certain actors that probably guarantee you Adam Sandler is the one that chose them all, you know, in a way. Now, that being said, Drew Barrymore did say she wanted to be like, uh, you know, a modern day, you know, Fred Astaire, Ginger Robert Rogers or something like that, you know, where it was like, like this adorable couple. And, you know, she wanted to do a movie with Adam Sandler, yeah. apparently. And it's ended up, you know, they, they've called each other their, their um, what do you call it? Um screen soulmates or movie yeah. soulmates yeah. or something like that it's like they're my soulmates I get that I get that but then there's also Jennifer Aniston so yeah. Jennifer Aniston I had talked about this earlier but she had um, she was dating one of Adam Sandler's friends way before they even got famous yeah. like I guess back in New York or something like mm-hmm. that but they were they were dating and they met in some kind of a sandwich shop or something you know they were just friends of friends basically yeah. she was dating one of his friends you know they met they talked or whatever and they've been friends ever since yeah and, you know, then they had, of course, they had the murder mystery and just go with it, which mm-hmm. is really cool to see those two. But, you know, it's one of those things where, like, you know, he'll have he'll have chemistry with anybody because that, you know, he has the rage filled side and the, the sweet side. Yeah. And, you know, both are as impactful as the other. Yeah. 
So, um, real quick before we really get into the meat of the movie, this was, this was released on Valentine's Day weekend in 1998. Um, it is the first uh, romantic lead that Adam Sandler has ever done. Um, and it's the first movie of Adam Sandler's to break $100 million for the gross of the box office. That makes sense. So, Billy Madison earned something like around $16 million. Um, Happy Gilmore earned something around thirty million. This one earned one hundred and sixty-seven million, and that's gross after earning back yeah. the budget. Yeah. So I mean, it's the first one to. I mean, that, yeah. that skyrocketed above the other two. So I mean, you know, you have a lot with that. You have a, you know, you have a lot with um, him being a romantic lead, the softer side of Adam Sandler, taking off the anger, all that kind of stuff. So. I think that's all really good. Um, my first question is, how did Julia and Mr. Gulia even hook up in the first place? They don't even seem like they would get along and like each other. And my yeah. second part of that question is, do you say Julia Gulia now every time you hear the name Julia? In your head, do you say Julia I, I want to say that I've heard, and I'll go back to the first question, but... I want to say I've heard somebody else use Julia Gulia. Julia Gulia, that's funny. In something else I've seen, a movie, a TV show. If anybody knows that, let us know. But I swear I've heard There's somebody a chef. use that. There's a famous chef. Well, not like famous, but like a TikTok chef or something yeah. like that. And her name is Julia something. But she goes by, it's like on Instagram or TikTok, she goes by Julia Gulia. Yeah. And she's been in some of these, you know, ads you see or whatever that are just part it's of their It's something else. Something. It's some, I've heard Julia Gulia somewhere else. But, but uh, every time I hear the name Julia, I go Julia. In my head, I go Julia Gulia. <laughs> I don't really. Julia yeah, Gulia. it's kind of one of those things I, I just don't, I guess I don't think about what you do. No, but, but I mean, it's like, you know, I it's see what one of those saying. things like her name's going to be Julia Gulia. It's kind of the same as like, you know, you eat pieces of shit for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, she and the fact that she doesn't, it takes her till the end of the movie to even realize. Yeah. She goes, Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Mrs. Glenn Gulia. Hello, it's nice to meet you. I'm Julia Gulia. Julia Gulia. Right when I wake up in the morning, you're the first person that pops in my head, and I keep thinking about you over and over. It's nice to meet you. I'm Mrs. Julia <laughs> Like, how long did it take her? I mean, now this is yeah, assuming that women just think about their last names. You know, but back then, you know, it used to be one of those things where girls would like, you know, if they liked a guy, they tried write their, their last notebook name. Yeah, over and over again. Notebook, yeah. You know, and maybe that was just a movie thing. I don't want to stereotype you know, women that way or whatever. But, you know, that's how it was presented. And so I was kind of interested to 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 see a scene where she, she it was like the night before her wedding and she doesn't even, or two nights before her wedding or whatever, and she doesn't even realize, wait a minute, my name's going to be Julia Gulia. Well, it, it, and it goes Robbie to... Hart. Hi, I'm pleased to meet you. I'm Mrs. Robbie Hart. Robbie and I are so pleased you could come to our wedding. It's just yeah. such an amazing contradiction to that, you know. So yeah. they make like Robbie Hart probably sounded normal, but when yeah. you put it next to Julia Gulia, my name's Julia Gulia. Oh, I'm Mrs. Robbie Hart. That sounds a lot better. Well, I think, and and back to your first question, you know, how they met. Guaranteed, she was a waitress Maybe of not some so sort. Much how many they met? How did they hook up? Like, how did they start well, dating? Well, uh, it, this is going to lead into how to explain the other stuff. The Julia g g realizing her last name. Will it explain how to lose your a guy in ten days? I don't know. You have to ask Matthew exactly. McConaughey. Something on that Matthew one. McConaughey has. To um, say. No, it, you know she's a waitress, right? And we don't know if she has always been a waitress that has worked wedding parties, or you know. But she was fairly new because Adam Sandler had not met her before. Well, in the movie, if you if you remember, there was a line she said, "I moved out here to be closer to him." Yeah, yeah. So she had obviously lived somewhere else. She wasn't from that town. Her sister probably was. Yeah. And she probably just started dating this guy. Like, he lives here. My sister lives there. I might as well move yeah. there. So yeah, that's what she was new to that town. I don't know how new, if she'd been there for a year or maybe a couple months or whatever, but she was new to that town. She hadn't yeah. been there. She goes, I moved here to be closer with him. Well, and, and my set, my explanation for it all is the fact that, you know, you've got two characters, right? You got Drew Barrymore's character and Adam Sandler's character, right? Mm -hmm. Both of them are, have been wanting to get married forever. 
You know, so, you know they, they talk about it all the time. Their friends talk about it, how both of them just want to be married. I don't really think it even matters who to in, in, in the character's mind, not the actor's mind or the writer's mind or the director's mind. I think in the character's mind, in a sense, it almost doesn't matter who they were going to get married to. Well, there's a lot to that because when she decides that she whenever she does the whole Julia Gooley and then mm-hmm. does the Robbie Hart and she's all happy and he thinks yeah. it's because of something else. Yeah. She goes to his house the next day and goes to be with him and to tell him that she loves him. Yeah. But at that point, she hadn't broke up with Glenn first. Yeah. So if this person was about Robbie, mm-hmm. then I think she would have done what she did did but like if, if a person is about the relationship like the, I don't like this relationship you know it, it feels like to me she should have broken up with him first yeah because no matter what Robbie says or how he feels yeah. I don't want to be part of this anymore well because and, he has a terrible yeah. last name yeah <laughs> well, well no but I mean yeah. you know he has a terrible last name and you know he's he's kind of uh, I don't think I'm in love with him but it was just weird to me that she so it might have been like well I just need to get married to somebody yeah. but I don't know I just felt like there was something no the, the more reason, to it the reason I say that right is because you know she she you know she felt to the point where you know she knows what kind of person he is. There's no way in, in God's green earth that a an intelligent person like she was could not see what kind of person she was marrying. And then, you know, with, with, with her fiance, he was just, you know, he made the quote of, you know, eventually you got to get married. You know, you just got to settle down. You got to get married. Does it? But his idea was thinking, you know, I, I've got, I got to have somebody at home. You know, maybe have some kids, but so just so that they can take care of me and I can just still go do whatever I want Wait, to. Who, who's who's uh, Julia's fiance? Yeah, yeah. You know that that was Glenn. his mindset. She had to know because he didn't want to do anything part of the wedding. He really, you know, he wanted to do the easy way out: go to Vegas, get married, come back, and not have to work on anything. You know, and so, uh, yeah. and, so, and 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 I felt like, you know, she had to have known what kind of person she he um, he was. Uh-huh. Just like, you know, Adam Sandler knew what kind of person Linda was but you know they, their friend and his sister was saying you know you've been wanting to get married and talking about getting married since you were like 14 you know and maybe like, that's why he plays weddings yeah. you know maybe he just you know he likes the thought but he's very good at it it's not just about the song it's about um, you know because he fixes the screw up yeah. that Steve Buscemi did yeah. as far as he could have ruined that could have ruined the whole wedding Yeah, but he saved it at the end by saying look People make mistakes, you know, but it's this day that matters because yeah. this is the day that you've decided to throw yeah. away every bad thing you've done in your he li- past. He likes the idea of it. Not so right. much, you know, not so much the soulmate and the, the, you know, spending the rest of, you know, it was just, he likes the idea of being married and so does she. And love songs yeah. and, and doing the, doing that whole thing. And, and Drew Barrymore loves, you know, she, she, you could tell that she just wanted to be married. You know, she just... She was excited for it, you know, for the process of it, but not really looking to the future of of what that actually means to be married, where same thing with Adam Sandler's character. Both of them just didn't really look forward to, you know, what it really means to be married, just all the stuff that leads up to it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and the, the actual day of it, you know, but not the future of it, you know what I'm saying? Because she wouldn't, as a, as a an intelligent human being, she would not uh, willingly marry... <laughs> that scumbag of a character you know well and i the way i saw it was like julia like from the very beginning julia was feeling it for robbie from the very beginning the first time they met when he was helping that kid puke out in the back of the the deal at the beginning of the movie i think she was feeling it from right to the start and she knew it she knew she was feeling that way i like yeah as soon as he came back you know she was like oh you know this guy's nice and everything like so she started to feel it i mean i'm not saying she fell in love that first night when she saw him but she started to feel it with him yeah. from the first moment they yeah. met, and she knew it. She was aware of it. Robbie was starting to feel it for Julia right away that first night, too, because he was talking with her and real interested in her and everything. Yeah. But he didn't know it right away because he's about to get married, and he yeah. still does love this other uh, other woman. Um, you know, he didn't realize it until, I think, the wedding announcement party when he finally got dragged out. Dragged I think you're out. right with it. I thought you were going to take it a different way, like you were saying, like he – he he realized it from the get go, but in, like you were saying, he was so focused right. on getting married to Linda that you know she was just a, a person. He was just being nice. Yeah, he was just being nice. Yeah, but but there was the underlying. First. He he felt something for her. 
Yeah. But he didn't recognize it as any kind of feelings because he was already doing it. It was like a split second feeling, and then he was just like, okay, now. Or um, maybe it's underneath or whatever, but either way, he wasn't aware of it. Yeah. Like, it was a subconscious or whatever. And, you know, the same thing with Drew Barrymore, but she was aware of it because from that point on, she was interested in everything he was doing. Oh, yeah. Peeking at him at weddings, at his wedding, and what are you doing now? Going over to his house. Why don't you help me with this? Doing that. Just play me a song. You know, she was always interested, and he's just like miserable the whole time. Yeah, because she was kind of using him in a way not not in a bad way but just using him because for one his contacts he knew he knew the wedding game very very well yeah. better than most you know but at the same time you know she was also trying to pull him out of his depression you know out of his right out of his yeah, down. She, so it's kind of a, a a double-edged sword on that one you know it started he, out with them being friends yeah them be, just being cordial or whatever but you know it's 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 one of these things where at the uh the wedding the, the announcement party or whatever when he went there and the dude was wearing the Michael Jackson glove, you know, I think they like kind of bonded over him giving his friend crap, <laughs> and she's like, "Oh, what are you gonna give me?" <laughs> and everything, and uh, it was just it, one of these things. It made him laugh. Yeah, and I doubt that uh, from the very brief amount of we saw of Linda, his first fiance or yeah. whatever, she didn't seem very funny. You know, no, no. it was it was one of these chicks. The, 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 one of these these girls he got with when he was younger who liked band people, but that's all she likes, and so she's yeah. real to surface level. She's extremely whatever, miserable in her life, obviously, because I mean, <laughs> yeah, just, you see the expression, the yeah, and all that. But um, <clears throat> so you know, I, I th- that's what I thought. I thought that they were they're feeling it at the same time, but one was aware of it and one wasn't until he was. Yeah, and you know, cause, so it kind of went back and forth with there. Um, you know, Alexis Arquette. I thought Alexis Arquette is like the, the 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 funniest in this, and 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 just just in rare rare little moments because first of all singing you know the Culture Club Boy George and, or not Boy George uh, yeah, yeah Boy George Boy George yeah singing Culture Club from uh, and Boy George give me time to realize my cry. And then, then he had to repeat it at the end. Song. And I'll tell you what, what I, it may be the funniest part of the movie for me, but I don't know if it isn't, it's very close. But all right, where one dude's just like, hey, you suck! <laughs> but it was like, yeah. it was loud like that. Was, yeah. You suck! And, and, you know, it was it was crazy because it's it by the end, she's crying. It's, yeah, it's one song, it's one song that, that he, the, the character knew and understood, yeah. and it, but it was the only one song. But you also <laughs> realize that it was a backup singer to mm-hmm. Adam Sandler's character, but this character had a lot more to do with, you know, playing all the music yeah. instruments. It was like, you know, you could tell that uh, Arquette was just very good at playing instruments and really wasn't a good backup singer, but, you know, Adam Sandler needs and, to break every and, once in a while. And the character had the look of Boy George, and I think Boy George has even come out and was like, you know, this was hilarious. Yeah. And everything. Um, uh, obviously, um, you know, Alexis Arquette isn't with us anymore. Um, let me see. 2016. So, uh, yeah, and I don't know the whole story behind that and everything, but, you know, we, we, we can dig into that because we're going to be doing... A couple other movies uh, um, with Alexis Arquette, but I just wanted to get into that. Um, also, Alexis Arquette's character's reaction to Robbie and and Drew Barrymore's reaction to Robbie, and basically everybody else's reaction to Robbie being miserable. Yeah, and they're just like they almost don't even care. Just go with it because <laughs> Robbie's breaking down on the mic. Yeah. <laughs> And he's just like, the way he's singing. <laughs> His first time back. Holiday, if we took a holiday. Took some time to celebrate. Just one day out of life. You can see Alexis Arquette just back there, big smile, and doing the backup vocals, just uh, like not worried about him at all. And then uh, whenever <laughs> he's like, but it all was, when he started singing yeah. that that song. You don't know how much I 
the end he's just like rubbing his head just like breaking down and crying and she's like smiling and laughing because she thinks it's funny <laughs> you know just all that and people not taking him breaking down and uh, the, those nieces or the nephews that he had that were just like you know uh you're going to a mental you're going into a mental institution <laughs> it was really weird to see that like like adam sandler not flip out on that old guy you know what I mean? That they paid for guy? the that paid for the bar mitzvah and everything else. Oh, he did. Or, or no, it was just the, the wedding with the, the mic cord. Reception. Yeah, but but I mean, you know, you didn't really. I mean, and Adam Sandler always seems to get his butt kicked in these movies too. If you notice, you know, by by, by old men. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So he's got the well, grandma feel, the and then he gets beat up by old men. There's a there when there's a couple things in this movie that wouldn't fly today, right? Yeah. There's an ongoing joke about people grabbing Drew Barrymore's butt. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That wouldn't go. Uh, what was the other thing that I mentioned earlier? Um, uh, they said something. I can't remember what it was, but you know, uh, most of the stuff from the nineties yeah. that that you wouldn't be able to get away yeah. with nowadays. But but I just I you know it goes to show to the talent of Adam Sandler's you know music ability. Yeah, you know, I mean, he's he's got a music ability. I mean, he. You know, you, you see a lot of people from Saturday Night Live do do types of sing, you know, types of music, you know, like Chevy Chase playing the piano. I mean, he's a very talented piano artist, you know, uh, piano player. And and Adam Sandler, Steve Martin playing the band. Yes, yeah, Steve Adam Martin, Sandler playing the guitar. Right, right. And and the fact that you know they create songs, you know, and and they're funny songs, you yeah. know, and and but Adam Sandler's got a good voice, you know, for 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 the t you know what he is, you know, he's a comedic actor. But he's got a voice on him. I mean, the guy's got talent. When the movie opened, I forgot that. I mean, I knew that how I remember how it opens with him singing, you know, spin me around. And um, but I guess maybe I forgot that he was the one singing it instead of. Yeah. I don't know. Lip syncing or whatever. But yeah, you know, when he certain times, certain times. It's kind of like, you know, he sounds good or maybe it's one of the situations where, you know. He, he thinks I don't know it's it's one of these where he almost sounds good yeah but I don't know I think he's just missing, got a voice there are a couple there are yeah. a couple songs that, that he does a pretty good job on yeah I mean even even some of the the jokey songs that he does you know is, is just he, he gets in there and he really plays the guitar you know and, and he's I think he's just talented in, in a lot of different you know areas when it comes to stuff like that you know and, and turkey 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 but but if you notice turkey for you yeah. <laughs> turkey for me he always does some sort of song in his movies i kind of feel like you know in a way you know he or always does. either that or music is a huge yeah. part of his movies yeah. you know you got like sticks and rush and stuff yeah and big daddy and then you got <clears throat> you know a couple other like uh oh what was it um not the b-52s what am I thinking? I don't even of? know who to compare that to. Now, who, to who, who, from. who did uh, "Every Breath You Take" uh, the Every cover breath. of? Not Sting. Not, not Sting or, or the police. Or the police. I mean, uh, it was UB40. Ah, yeah, yeah. I yes. think B52, UB40. Yeah. It's all letters and numbers and stuff. Yeah. But UB40, they did. Uh, they also did um, "Fools Rush," not "Fools Rush In." Can't help That's fall Elvis. in love. Yeah, I know. But <laughs> it's a cover of that, and they named yeah. it "Can't Help Fall in Love." But uh, the music in Fifty First yeah, Dates yeah, is yeah. great. Big Daddy's got yeah. insanely great music. You know, obviously this one does. Even Happy Gilmore did. You know, I mean the the theme song of Happy Gilmore is Leonard Skinner. Yeah, yeah. you know. So I mean, it's it's you know, music I think is as big as much to Adam Sandler well, as U.S.S. because I mean, and that's how Adam Sandler started out, kind of. You yeah. Know, his, his uh, lunch lady. His well, and his brother and his family thought that you know. 
he was really funny guy you should try out that but then he also dabbled in music and so when he got on saturday night live he was doing music stuff and well did you notice like it, it, throughout this movie before you know his the air the airplane scene where he's singing uh, her song right you know they, did you notice that they were playing the music to that song several times throughout the yeah, movie yeah i want to tell you because you know there's a lot of time in movies whenever you have um <clears throat> Uh, like you have a well, it, well. It's called a medley, right? Yeah. So a medley is like um, a mixture of different musics, and yeah. so you'll have, uh, you know, at the theme, you know, the the. <laughs> I still think of The Office when uh, somebody's trying to ask Daryl a question, like Michael. They're watching Andy's play. Yeah. And uh, Daryl's like, shh, shh, shh. If we don't listen to the overture, we won't recognize the musical themes when we come back later. All right. I'm sorry. And really, you just didn't want to talk to yeah. Michael and stuff. <laughs> but, I mean, it's true. Like, you, you know, you have, like, Sweeney Todd or different musicals, yeah. especially if it's Broadway. You have a medley at the beginning, which which has bits of all the different songs throughout in it. Yeah. And then you hear those themes later on throughout the play and everything. So, you know, it's it's I do want to get into it because, I mean, uh, the the music, obviously, it's it's from a song that he wrote in the movie uh, called Grow Old With You. Um, but it's on the like the Wedding Singer soundtrack and uh, all that kind of stuff. I want to make you smile. Kind of, it gave me a real feeling of the fifty first dates too, or fifty first dates gave me a real feeling of that, you know, because it, he 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 sings these songs to Drew Barrymore. Have you, if you noticed, you know what I mean? And it's like, you know, it, it's it's kind of hilarious how he does that. So um, yeah, it was written by Adam Sandler. It was written by him and uh, Tim Hurley, which who yeah. was writing partner and stuff. And so they wrote it for the movie. I'm guessing he did most of the music part. Yeah. Maybe Tim Hurley helped him come up with kind of some of the funny quotes, you know, mm -hmm. put you to bed when you've had too much to drink or let you yeah. even let you hold the remote control. I'll miss you. in love with you <laughs> so uh you know that is it's okay i i put this scene with him playing the you know him coming through the curtain i'll miss you uh -huh. and uh you know we're him, first class we could do anything we want yeah, to you know, we were we been in first class with passenger where since we let them do pretty much whatever they want <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, I put the scene with him and the airports or and the airplane singing to her and the other guy getting shoved in the bathroom. I put it up there with like the, you know, uh, what is it, Notting Hill? I think like yeah. you know, I'm just a boy standing in front of a girl. You yeah. know, those one of those epic 
final rom-com scenes yeah. where you have, you know, the last um, act of, of yeah. uh, romantic gestures yeah. or whatever. And they just, I mean, you see, you know, when they get close right before the kiss and stuff, it just seems like very natural, you know, it just seems like it makes sense. I watched it a couple of times when I rewatched it for this, for this podcast, <clears throat> when I got to that scene, I kept rewinding it because Drew Barrymore's ex- expressions, uh, her, you know, how she's conveying um, how overwhelmed she is yeah. that he's here because she's kind of been in love with him for the whole movie. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But the fact that he's here on this plane doing what he's doing and everything, and she just wanted a normal married life with somebody who loved her and supported yeah. her and, and all that kind of stuff, not somebody who she was going to have to cater to, this guy who's not a very good person and all this stuff. But for him to be like, these are all the things I'm going to do for you. These are all the things I want. I want to take care of you. I want to, you know, us to take care of each other. I want to grow old with you. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's something, excuse me, for whatever reason before, I, I, I don't think I had noticed it, but, you know, whenever uh, she realized that, or whenever he realized that he loved her and back, you know, whenever she's listening and she realized you know, whenever the 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 old yeah, what's her name yeah. was singing, mm-hmm. um, she he remembered her saying, you know, I just want someone to grow old with, and that's where that came from the song. And I, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure that's one of those things where yeah. I'm the only one that missed it. Yeah, but you know, a, a cool little foreshadowing yeah. like that. Um, like I said, I put the scene down with whether any any other epic um, romantic gestures, final romantic gestures, and in, in any rom coms, and <clears throat> they actually. Uh, brought it back a little bit. Um, Adam Sandler and Jim and uh, and Drew Barrymore were on the Jimmy Fallon show. Yeah, I think Drew Barrymore was pregnant at this time. This is after they released Blended, so it was only a couple years ago. I mean, you're you're a great romantic uh, comedy couple. Every ten years, we get yeah. to fall in love again. <laughs> so so those two are together, and you know, of course, she did Fever Pitch with Jimmy yeah. Fallon and stuff. So they did this little musical thing where Jimmy stood in the back with the guitars, and they did the song called Every Ten Years, and it's basically how. They're, they are um, uh, meant to be, what do you call it? Um, destined to be, uh, I just said soulmates. it. Earlier. Soulmates. Soulmates, yeah. that's it. So, uh, you know, they're, they're movie soulmates, right? Yeah. So, you know, they, they did this whole song where it's, it's you know. Um, Every ten years I promise to love you. I'll always be true even as we get older. I still remember the first time I met you. You gave me a hug and I got a boner. (laughs) You made me laugh in The Wedding Singer. And then we went on 50 first dates. You are the Fred to my Ginger Rogers. You're the Rob Ford to my crack cocaine. (laughs) Am I your best movie husband? Of course you are, Adam. Better than Hugh Grant. Much better than Grant. Better than Ben Stiller. Much better than Stiller. Better than Jimmy Fallon. You both have great qualities. I'll take that. I will still love you when you're 64. I will still love you when your boobs touch the floor. (laughs) So right now? (laughs) Yeah. Not yet. (laughs) Truth is, you've made me better than I ever thought I could be. Every ten years, you'll you'll always always have have me. They finished the song, and you could tell that was all Drew rehearsed. But then Adam and, and Jimmy Fallon had a little extra thing planned that she didn't know about. And where he goes, Oh, I could be the man who grows old with you. I want to grow old with Drewy. Thank you. 
Drew Barrymore just lost it. She starts crying. Really? She's just like, she puts her hand, she's like, oh my gosh, and everything. And then they give a hug, and he goes, I want to grow old with Drew. Yeah. And then they hug real big, and all this kind of, and everybody everybody cheered and everything. It's like one of the coolest little callbacks. Yeah, and Adam Sandler's been happily married for however long, you know? And he met his wife in the next movie we're doing next week. Yeah. But where Drew Barrymore has been very, um, let's say, not had the greatest uh, luck with relationships per se comparable to Adam Sandler she's gone bad I mean she's had a lot of other personal yeah. problems too and everything yeah. and then we, I do want to get into that more but I'm saving that for uh, 50 first dates I, I, uh, I, and, and I, I it's very hard to see I mean again you know she started out in E.T. and stuff like that you know right. and, and Firestarter and things like that but you know I mean for as acting as long as that woman has acted you know it it doesn't surprise me at all that it's very fi- hard to find a movie that she's not good in. Yeah, and I just want to say that the that the biggest appeal of this movie for me is Drew Barrymore, and it's not just out of you know attraction or whatever. I mean, obviously she's absolutely drop dead, stunning, gorgeous. Yeah. Um, but it's her personality. It's um the way that you hear that she is in real life. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, and she's just she plays adorable so well. Yeah. But she plays. Like uh, uh, a miscreant or a misfit, very well yeah. too. You know, boys on the side or Mad yeah. Love or whatever. And I just want to say, she was in Mad Love with Christopher O'Donnell. Yeah. And a quick story about that: Lucas, uh, our cousin, uh, when we were younger, him, me, and uh, our other cousin Diana were in uh, a video store, and I don't know if you remember this, but we wanted to rent a Batman movie and a Power Rangers movie and she wanted to rent Mad Love with Christopher oh with Chris I think O'Donnell I remember that Drew actually Barrymore. and uh, so we just shouted her down yeah because you know we're yeah. awesome cousins mm-hmm. like that but she kept saying I want that and we could only get two movies and we kept every time she'd try to talk we'd go Batman and Power Rangers <laughs> Batman and Power Rangers and she kept trying to say but I want to end and then she'd tell on us but as she was trying to tell on us we kept saying Batman and Power Rangers <laughs> and of course Lucas's mom was just laughing at the whole thing so she wasn't much help but uh, you know it was just one of those those funny things that, yeah. that I always I'll always remember Mad Love I always remember that situation and, uh, and the way uh, Diana acted uh, with it well um, I, but yeah just, sorry I just wanted to say Drew yeah. Barrymore any movie that she's in I, I love when she plays this adorable character because yeah. she has a certain lisp in yeah. her voice and the, her way of speaking um, where you could still hear that E.T. voice yeah uh, the Gertie voice from E.T. Uh, the, the, I don't know she's, she, she just plays adorable and and sweet and innocent very well yeah. she yeah. could play both but um, I just enjoy her like this and the chemistry that she has with Adam Sandler is one of these where it's it's undeniable it's it it's it's up there with the tops yeah as far as people who have done multiple movies together that have very good chemistry you know, for for me for it, me for, I'd put it up top but well for me with her it's just she just seems like she's always having fun you know whatever movie she's doing you see beside behind the scenes even on the films you know like the character she plays she's got blood all over yeah. her and she's like back there dancing yeah. around and everything yeah but but she just seems like she's just enjoys acting like she's one of those people that'll probably be acting until she's a hundred years old you know she she started out oh, she's when got she, her own talk show yeah I know but I mean she's starting out you know she's started off when she was like six or something and then uh you've been acting she'll she'll be acting her entire life she's not one of those people that just it doesn't seem like she just gets tired of it you know what i mean she just moves to different facets and and goes back to stuff that works for her you know and and you know that i can that's probably why adam sandler works out so well and they work out together 15 months old yeah for her first role she was a commercial like a commercial or something like a toddler or something but you know oh i gotta tell i gotta talk about the scene before i forget it okay we're in there in the airport, and he's about to buy the ticket. You like flock of seagulls? I can tell you do. <laughs> but not even so much that, too. But the fact that he's like, Can I borrow your credit card? You're going to pay me back, right? No. But if you don't give it to me, I'm going to tell everybody what you said at the bar. <laughs> and then he gives it to her, and she goes, that was so nice. And he's like, oh, thanks. So that worked But out. it just seems such an honest, again, one of these. Because and, and that's find something these I Adam would do to you. Yeah, yeah. But you find these in Adam Sandler <laughs> movies that 
that it just seems like like these guys probably joke about this stuff off screen yeah, too. You like know? like like when Adam Sandler gets the best of these these actors yeah. that are friends of his. Yeah. You know the 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 same ones that are the Peter Dante, the Alan Cover. Yeah. All those people that are usually in his when he gets the better of them. Yeah. I don't know why, but it is so funny, and it's usually because of Adam Sandler's reaction. Yeah. He'll he'll have a little smirk about it, or he'll you can tell he's Make, like on the verge of laughing. About yeah. It. Almost like you know he's doing this off scene too. That or this is just. Like Nothing something rift, and they have yeah. to, like something that they didn't tell the director they were gonna do, yeah. and everything, and it just kind of spontaneously comes you gonna out. You pay me back? No. <laughs> but if you don't tell, if you don't do it, I'm gonna tell everybody what you said at the bar last night. I love that scene. I mean, it, th- throughout this movie, uh, you know, great chemistry b- between Adam Sandler and and Drew Barrymore. You know, un 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 uh, topped there, but unparalleled. But with Alan Culver and 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 Adam Sandler, this movie were hilarious together. Yeah. I mean, and, and you guys are going to hear us talk a lot more about him too. Yeah. But, but it just Over these the two characters, movie. I mean, they, they just flow so well and, and, and it's just, you know, they, they react, you could tell their friends off screen. I mean, they have to be because it's just too much that, you know, you, you, you cause they feed off each other a lot. You know what I mean? And, and, you know, it's almost like he's been there before with Adam Sandler. You know what I mean? Like, you've been through Adam Sandler's depression period, you know, his character, whatever. But he doesn't let anything bother him, you know what I mean? Yeah. Alan Cover- and then the fact that, you know, on his limo, it said kinky on his limo. <laughs> I like how... <laughs> Such a I like how when they were auditioning the him for the job, <laughs> and he, he's, like, trying to throw the mannequins in the back seat as <laughs> fast as he can. You, you hit tell, two cones! You tell Rob, he's, like, trying not to laugh or whatever, and he's like... He's like, he's your friend. Of course, I'm going to hire him. And he goes, I know, but I like to mess with him. <laughs> and he's like, cutting close, buddy. He's like, ah. It, was, it reminded me of Dwight. Yeah. Whenever Dwight yeah. was running around the building and she she's just holding a thermometer. She's not yeah. even holding a stop clock. And then she, she goes, you better hurry if you're going to beat Toby. And he's like, ah. <laughs> and I think, you know, I've just come to a realization. I think I know why I like Adam Sandler movies so much. Why? Because he tortures his friends i mean he he just you know he to things that he th- thinks is hilarious and just making fun of his friends the entire time i find that hilarious as well yeah you know what i mean and and, and it's usually the funniest parts of the scene are when he is clowning on his friends you know what i mean <laughs> and people that do things for him and you know are there for him and and possible times when he makes him try out for the limousine he's like you hit two cones and there's <laughs> a couple scenes like that in the next movie we're gonna do yeah <laughs> big daddy is is one of these movies where um it, it's it's the first one that i think that's got real heart to it first of his movies yeah. that, that has real heart i mean this one kind of does but it's more like you know just a, a recreation of the yeah. old you know the old movies back in the yeah. day like the the ginger rogers and but Fred the only Stanley problem where, yeah but this movie is chock full, you know big daddy's chock full of a lot of stuff that would not fly nowadays it is but it also is um it represents it you know, it doesn't have yeah. it not in there. Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, it's, it, it, I think it kind of shows this weird stage of the progression of, you know, social um, outlook on the homosexuality issue or whatever yeah. that was kind of frowned upon in the 90s and or raising whatever. children. That's another yeah, thing. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of these things where smash it, cans it in the grocery store. It may not be as sensitive to people nowadays as a lot of the movies that are coming out nowadays but it was it was taking those first few steps to yeah. to making sure that people certain people weren't offended or, or yeah. made fun of or outclassed or whatever but well, it also has it in Chuck and Larry well know? and that's yeah we and we had already I think mentioned that last episode that it, we, he probably made up for it but you know it's one of these things where it's a lot of the funny gags funny yeah. jokes with I think I like that he encourages the to hit to have the kid to hit somebody in the the junk every once in a while yeah I think this that movie was also like my first exposure to John Stewart in a way you know what I mean like <laughs> like remember what he teaching the kid I, I can't talk about yeah yeah we'll talk about yeah, it I gotta episode. save it but but no with with <laughs> you know the underlying the main main thing on this story is not so much their characters as it is as it is the music and the representation of the 80s which I think the director did brilliant brilliant brilliantly you always have a problem with that I right? know I don't know <laughs> uh what does that say about me <laughs> um no but but he 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 portrays what I guarantee you he wanted to portray. I, I felt that in this movie. I, I felt that Adam Sandler's character and his writing for this character portrayed 
what was intended. And Drew Barrymore, same thing. You know, I, I felt like every single character i could see the director's vision and adam sandler's vision in this movie and what they wanted to get done with it and i i feel like it came to uh um full uh fruition you know yeah what I, mean? I like i like adam sandler's confidence at the very beginning and then how he loses it throughout the movie and then gains it back yeah to play the guitar on the plane at the end but i mean he's got that confidence on stage while he's singing you know spin me around and everything but yeah, it's really good. Uh, and like I said, Julia, the new girl in town who's very innocent. Uh, you can't say that Drew Barrymore was typecast in those types of roles because she did horror. She did these yeah. dramas where she was an out, out, you know, outlaw rebel. Mm-hmm. You know, she went on the Letterman show and flashed him. And she was a yeah. wild. Started fires. Yeah. You know. <laughs> uh, but I mean, she was a wild one back in the day. And, you know, she has a lot of family history that goes with that. Yeah. And we'll talk about that more in the 51st Days episode. Uh, but Drew Barrymore's had quite a history, and uh, her family's had quite a history and everything. So, you know, she comes from a long line of of, of actors and everything yeah. too. So, you know, it's it's and uh, you know she has links to Spielberg and and different yeah. things like that. So she's a huge mainstay in Hollywood. Um, but I just I, I don't think I've ever seen anything that I don't like what she's I, done. <laughs> Uh, Charlie's Angels was enjoyable. I mean, Firestarter, yeah. E.T. was great. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, those Charlie's Angels movies. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. They're like Citizen Kane when you watch the newer Charlie's Angels. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. With Chris. Oh, I, I don't know if I can say that because I only watched like 10 minutes of it before I turned it off. I didn't even watch it because I refused to. I mean, granted, Elizabeth Banks is awesome. I but tried to I, give it a chance because I wanted to see how Elizabeth direction? Banks did and everything like that. And I know there's a lot of controversy yeah. after it, you know, based on her saying, well, it's, well, and, you know, we'll yeah, get yeah, it yeah. later. But anyways, uh, we really enjoyed this movie. Yep. I enjoyed watching it again. I, I'm enjoying going back to these movies and being like, Oh, uh, you know, I love Adam Sandler, but I'm like, man, I watched those movies so many times. But once I get them started, then it's like, okay, I haven't. It's been long enough that they're entertaining again because yeah. we did watch them so much that it yeah. got it got a little little bit too much, mm-hmm. and then I had, you know, we had to stop watching them for years, I yeah. think. But like, Big Daddy is one that I'm really, really excited for, and yeah. I almost put it on last night, just saying, hey, you know, we're gonna record with it soon, anyways. I might yeah. as well. But I want to wait because I wanted to focus on this, and I had to do the other episode too. But I'm gonna watch uh, Big Daddy this week. And I'm so excited for it because there's so many funny parts and, you know, like some of my favorite parts, you know, with him giving Leslie Mann crap. And yeah. Well, and the, kid, I gotta the kid's a great that. actor, too. In the, yeah, yeah. You know? Well, both of them. Phenomenal those, job. Dylan and yeah, Cole Sprouse. Yeah, brothers, yeah. Yeah, and then, of course, you got Cole doing Riverdale, uh, Riverdale now. Now. Yeah. And I don't know what happened to the other one, but. Sweet Life of Cody and something Zach else. And Cody. Zach and Cody. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, the Sweet Life and the Sweet Life on Deck. I watched a lot of Disney Channel with my kids. <laughs> I get that. I get that. <laughs> but anyways, if uh, if you guys get a chance to watch this, please please do. Um, I get nervous telling, I'm not nervous, but you know, I get kind of iffy about telling people to rent movies like this, especially older movies, because you know nowadays yeah. it's harder for some people that never watched this before to go back to the '90s. If you can watch free, definitely watch it. If it's on TV, definitely watch it. If you can rent it. I, I'd say watch it if you like Drew Barrymore and Adam Sandler. Can I ask you one question before what? we end this? Do you think that this movie is one of those uh, timeless type movies where you can watch it really, any generation can really watch it and you think find enjoyment from it? Meaning 20 years from now, do you think it'll still be relevant and do you think it, it still will be enjoyable to you know younger generations? Uh, I don't know if it'll be enjoyable. I, I think it, it, it's got a long shelf life, longer than it should because, I mean, most movies that you know that really centralize you know sci-fi is good because you can pretty much watch that anytime because it's just some person's yeah. view of how the future would yeah. look it never represents a certain time can't watch back to the future anymore because that time's passed and we don't have uh hovering skateboards right but you know with the this 80s thing it was made in the 98 but it was based in 85 and it worked because you know they would they would point out a lot of the things like, you know, the, the re- dressing ridiculously yeah. like Michael Jackson, the, uh, somebody made a Don Johnson joke about the <laughs> other guy wearing, wearing what he wore. And, you know, so they joked about being in the eighties. Yeah. So it wasn't like, like fast times or yeah. not, not uh, maybe not even fat. Well, yeah, I, I guess fast, fast times where, you know, it's, it's, you could definitely tell filmed in the eighties, all about the eighties and everything. Yeah. But this kind of, it's almost like kind of a, a love letter to the 80s, but also yeah. satirizing it and everything. So it's lasted a lot longer, but I think 
that we're at a point now because of the types of movies we have where everything's hyper realistic and all that. I just don't know how many people would get an enjoyment out of it that didn't know Adam Sandler. Yeah. So like I think somebody that knows Adam Sandler now, sees some of his more recent funnier movies, they could get some enjoyment out of it. Mm-hmm. When 20, 30 years from now, people aren't really watching Adam Sandler – uh, or, or or he's not really doing anything, yeah. uh, whether he's not around or whatever. But you know, I I just think that movies like this will just kind of fade out. Okay. Uh, there are certain movies that'll always last. Yeah. You know, The Godfather and Citizen Kane. You could even watch that. And yeah. Get some enjoyment out well, of. Hopefully not Avatar anymore. But, <laughs> no, hopefully not the Avatar movies, but. Anyways, uh, I'm glad we're both enjoying ourselves, and I know that we're not digging into movies like we usually do but we're just trying to have fun with these you can't really dig into Adam Sandler they're yeah, really they're on the face movies. of everything yeah, you know? yeah. So. and it's mainly about like you remember this joke you remember yeah. that joke and it everything it makes you laugh fun. Yeah, it makes you laugh yeah. yeah and there's really no huge high stakes I think that's yeah. going to change more with our last two or three movies but yeah. um or even Big Daddy, really. Yeah, so this is more just about trying to dig into what's behind it, uh, talking about the actors and the interactions and everything. So um, we are going to dig more into the story in the next three episodes and everything, so definitely join us for that. But um, we enjoy this. We definitely recommend it. Uh, it is definitely it is uh, actually the highest-rated uh, comedy movie that Adam Sandler has ever done on Rotten Tomatoes. We don't pay much attention to Rotten Tomatoes, but we look at the audience scores, and that's what I care about. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and that really just gives kind of an average consensus, but you can kind of base on if you want to watch it or not off of that. Um, but definitely give this movie a watch if you get a chance. Um, and, uh, and, and, and watch Big Daddy, watch Punk Drunk, Punch Drunk Love, and watch 50 First Dates uh, with us um, over this next month um, so we can get through it. And uh, they're really, really good movies, really funny movies. Um, yeah, it's just the Adam Sandler humor. If you don't know, like Adam Sandler, you know, uh, you know these movies aren't aren't going to be good for you. You're not going to yeah. enjoy them, and you're not you may not enjoy what we talk about. But we're trying to dig into the behind the scenes stuff because a lot of people like that yeah. as well. So if you don't yeah. like Adam Sandler's, we still might have some good nuggets for you. So definitely come back. Um, you know, over the next few weeks as we get through this, and then we got a couple more episodes after that. Um, the Justified or uh, the Groundless epi- uh, episode that I, uh, I, I guest start on um, yesterday will be out sometime this week. So uh, once that releases, uh, it'll be episode or season two, episode twelve, uh, Reckoning. Uh, so go go give that a listen and go give those uh, guys a good rating, good review. They're really awesome dudes and they break down those episodes really well. I think. Um, if you guys want to get a hold of us, we're on all social media at The Post Credit Podcast, except for Twitter, we're at The Post Credit. Our website is www.thepostcreditpodcast.com. We're also on YouTube. Um, and our email is thepostcreditpodcast at gmail.com. So uh, hit us up. Let me let us know what your favorite Adam Sandler movies are. And uh, you know, let us know if you watch Justified. Uh, touch base with us here um, and, and, and let us know what your favorites are. We appreciate you guys listening. And we'll see you next time. And throw me a bone.